Welcome back as we continue to look at the life of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. In our last study we looked from, at the beginnings of the organization in the early assembly as recorded in Acts chapter 6. When seven men were appointed to administer to assembly's benevolence, they were chosen to take care of the needy, especially to take care of the needy widows. There was a distinction made between the work of the evangelist, evangelism and providing benevolence to needy saints. Even religious leaders who are in error can be taught the word of God, and there will be those who will reject the word of God. Some people will be strongly affected by God's word. The verse 7 of that chapter reports a wonderful effect that followed the solution of what might have become a damaging problem. The word of God increased. Its effects were even more powerfully demonstrated because the number of disciples multiplied greatly in the city. A great many of the priests obeyed the gospel. Then something happened which changed the religious climate in Jerusalem completely, something which caused a break with Judaism. The Jewish people, who had been delighted with the thought that this was a new vital movement within Judaism, came to understand that these followers of Christ were something very different. It was, in fact, a new faith. And these preachers were not simply trying to breathe new life into the old Mosaic religion. The result was that the preaching of Stephen created a decisive break between Judaism and Christianity, and the assembly lost the popular support which it had enjoyed up to that time. The persecution which followed came from a new direction. Up to this time it was mainly the priests, the Sadducees, who had been responsible for the persecution, as we had already seen. Now, now we will see that it comes from the Pharisees who managed to get the support of the people behind them. Up to this point our focus in the book of Acts has been upon the twelve, upon Peter and John. Now there is a change. With the appointment of the first seven men to serve in Acts chapter 6, 1 to 6, we see these men develop into leading figures within the assembly. Luke will introduce us to these two. Stephen confronts the Jews in Jerusalem faces false accusations, addresses the Jewish Sanhedrin, and ultimately is stoned to death. Philip preaches to the Samaritans, faces a false magician, shares the gospel with an Ethiopian eunuch, snatched away suddenly by the Holy Spirit. Notice also we come to Acts chapter 6 verse 8, we come to the first great historical sermon in the assembly's history. The longest speech in the book of Acts, the first Christian martyrdom. The introduction of, of this young man named Saul of Tars Tarsus. The Stephen, a man full of God's, God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Who was Stephen? Stephen was one of the ones chosen by the Hellenistic Jews to serve the congregation. He seems to be an, an eloquent and fiery preacher also. He was also a man just like you and me. Had the same sort of problems that we face and the same sort of struggles, just like you and me, he was saved to serve. We have a tendency to look for Christian heroes. We find them, we put them on pedestals, but there are no super Christians. The closer you get to your Christian heroes, the more you will likely see that they are just like us. They have the same faults and the same struggles. That means we can identify with Stephen as we identify with him. We will be able to learn from him. We're first introduced to Stephen in the first verse of Acts chapter 6 as one of the men chosen by the assembly to oversee the equal distribution of food to the needy widows. His name is a Greek name meaning crown. The setting, the word of God, kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. A great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. The assembly had seen a great deal of growth. It had become an explosion and I continue to see growth, growing numbers. It's stated in three ways. The word of God kept spreading. The reason that these men had been appointed was so that the twelve could focus upon their ministry of prayer and the word of God. The number of disciples continued to increase. This increase had not yet extended outside the city of Jerusalem. This was the home of the early assembly, and his children had not yet left home. A great many of the priests were coming to the faith. An entire priesthood was divided into 24 separate courses. Each course was given the responsibility of serving the temple twice a year, 
or an additional four weeks out of the year at special festival days, all of the priests would come together to serve. As these priests rotated through Jerusalem, they had the opportunity to hear the gospel, the good news that Jesus had died and risen from the dead. Many believed and became a part of the growing congregation. It was this factor that would lead to an intensifying of the persecution. The signs. Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. The qualification of those who were to serve in Acts chapter 6 well, they had to be full of the Spirit and of wisdom. This is now seen as Stephen, who is full of grace and power. Verse 3 says, seven men full of the Spirit and wisdom. Verse 5, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, Stephen, full of grace and power. Stephen be given miraculous abilities when the apostles laid hands on the seven. In verse 6, when he had been set apart for service, this would have included a gift of discernment in dealing with the widows. Notice the three words in that verse. Power, wonders, signs. The word power, dynamis, reveals the acts Stephen performed among the people, the miracles. The word wonders, terata, tells us the effect of these acts of power had on the people. The word signs, simia, reveals a significance or purpose of the acts of power they were meant to tell the people something, to point the people in a certain direction. These signs accompanied his preaching. Verse 9 and 10 tells us what an effect, what an impact that preaching had on those who heard him. For the first time the Jewish rulers have a target they think is easier to attack than an apostle of Christ. As they done with Jesus, they find false witnesses who will lie about what they've heard Stephen say. Under Jewish law, speaking against Moses, or the law, was punishable by death. The message Stephen proclaimed was irrefutable. They were unable to overcome him on the basis of the facts. Stephen was a powerful proclaimer of the gospel. He was not numbered with the apostles, but he did proclaim the gospel in the open square. The slander, verse 9. But some men from the what was called the synagogue of freedmen, including both Syrians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. Verse 10, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Stephen's ministry to the Hellenistic widows put him into contact with many Greek-speaking Jews. While there were many who believed the gospel, there were many others who did not, and who viewed this new sect of Christians with suspicion. But let us say a word about synagogues. The word itself simply denotes a gathering together. Therefore, a synagogue was a meeting place. We need to realize that meetings in the early assembly were more closely related to synagogues than to the temple worship. The synagogue system probably began during the captivity in Babylon, when obviously the Jewish captives had no temple in which to worship. They still needed to keep their faith alive and be taught the law of God. They still needed to preserve the national identity. Thus, these gatherings were arranged. They became centers where benevolence was ministered. They became centers where the law was taught. They became centers of social life for the exiles. The system was so effective that when they returned to Jerusalem, even though the temple was rebuilt, they brought the synagogue idea back with them. Indeed, it became a rule that where there were ten Jewish families, they were expected to set up a synagogue. Although he had no priesthood, no sacrifices, these ten families were also expected to support a man who worked with the synagogue, and the regular service which was held there considered of, consisted of the Shema, a prayer led by one in charge of the service. A reading from the scriptures. On weekdays this would be a reading from the law, and on the Sabbaths we were reading from the prophets. Then there would be an exposition or sermon presented by any capable man. Jews from different lands had their own synagogues in Jerusalem, which is not surprising considering the fact that Hebrew-speaking Jews were inclined to look down on the Greek-speaking brethren. We see there was this 
synagogue of the freedmen, the authorised fashion says, the Libertines. Both words indicate people had formerly been slaves, but have obtained their freedom. There's also synagogues where Cyrenians met people with North Africa and Alexandrians from Egypt, Cilicians, Asians, areas in which today is known as Turkey. These men began to argue with Stephen. The debates between the two parties grew heated and the Jews began to cast accusations at the assembly and specifically at Stephen. These antagonists came from the synagogue of the freedmen, literally synagogue of the libertarians. It was evidently a synagogue which started for the Greek-speaking Jews who had once been Roman slaves but now have been released and allowed to return to Palestine to live. There were men from a number of countries. Syrians located in North, Northern Africa, Alexandrians from the Nile Delta, Cilicia, South and Western Turkey, the province which as Apostle Paul came from, Asia located in Central Turkey. These men spoke the same common language as Stephen, yet there was a great and bitter disagreement. Stephen was accused of blasphemy and this soon led to civil proceedings. Jews born in Israel, were not, were not free citizens of the Roman Empire. But Jews who belonged to the special synagogue were born in free cities. They had Roman citizenship by birth. Saul, who later became an apostle, must have been one of these. He, he was from Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. He had Roman citizenship from birth. Saul was there when Stephen was being murdered. All these were individuals who were not natives of Jerusalem. Could it be these men were more zealous than the residents of Jerusalem? Does zeal heighten when travelling to a special holy place? But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit in which he was speaking. These people objected strongly to what Stephen was preaching. He was evidently presenting um, the message concerning Jesus and the new covenant, and they disputed with him. They argued with him. But his reasoning was so powerful, it was unanswerable. And so they resorted to lying. And it was these lies which stirred up the people. The opposition came mainly from the Pharisees, and I suppose they noticed that their arch enemies, the Sadducees, had failed to secure the support of the people. And therefore, they resorted to different tactics. They leveled accusations against Stephen, which they knew would arouse the anger of the population. These men intentionally lie and deceive to get the outcome they desire. They do all this in the name of God. Matthew 26 verse 59 says, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. When they couldn't silence Jesus, they brought false charges against him. Here they do the same thing against Stephen. We have heard him say blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Eventually there were three charges they accused Stephen of. Speaking blasphemy against Moses and God. Speaking against the law. Speaking against the temple, which he described as this holy place, which suggests that this took place within the temple area. Since he's charged them into blasphemy, there could only be one penalty. If they were proved, and that was the stoning by stoning, death by stoning, and since they clearly sought the death sentence, they arrested him and they brought him before the council for trial. Verse 12 says, And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. Verse 13, They put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place in the law, for we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Verse 15, And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the, on the council saw his face like a face of an angel. The council probably refers to Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the official governing body of the Jews whose decision was subject only to the Romans consisting of about 71 influential men, including the high priest. Verse 13 and 14 says, They set up false witnesses against, and said, This man never ceases to speak words against the holy place and the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus will destroy this place and will destroy the customs. Blasphemy, 
against the holy place, against the law, change the customs Moses delivered. Psalm 27, give me not up, the, up to the will of my adversaries for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. Psalm 35 says, malicious witnesses rise up, they ask me, me of things that I do not know. To blaspheme is to speak against God. Stephen is accused of speaking against God. As he relates to two areas, the holy place and the law. We have heard him say this, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and alter the customs. The charges were remarkable like those were leveled against Jesus when he was arrested and tried and turned over to the Romans for crucifixion. Indeed, there is a correlation between these two events. This is exactly what they did to Jesus. The charge was even the same, to destroy the temple, but they have more love for the building than they do for God. What part of the accusations were true and what parts were not true? Sometimes the worst lies are half-truths. The same thing happened to Jesus. False witnesses testified before him, uh, before the Sanhedrin. These false witnesses must have known that they would be protected by Jewish rulers who would do anything themselves to get rid of any leader of the church. God does not always prevent evildoers from carrying out their evil plans. Remember Ahab's murder of innocent Naboth? The king law of uh, Moses said no accusation of crime should be, could be substantiated against a person except in a testimony of at least two eyewitnesses. So I had to get at least two false witnesses to testify in their court, the Sanhedrin, against Stephen. Although the law prescribed the death penalty for bearing false witness, these men were willing to break the law and risk death themselves to get rid of Stephen. Both were arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. Both were accused by false witnesses. Both were accused of speaking against the temple law. Ultimately, both were put to death. Stephen is on trial for having taught what Jesus taught. And as he stands before the Sanhedrin, his countenance appears almost heavenly. Why? Because he's filled with the Spirit of Christ. There were certain things which Stephen saw clearly, but most of which his accusers either didn't understand or refused to accept. He saw that Christianity was not part of Judaism. He saw that the law was merely intended to operate until the Messiah came. It was a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. As Paul later expressed in Galatians chapter 3.24, the law was never meant to be permanent. As for the temple, this was not the only place in which God could be worshipped, nor was it God's true dwelling place. As for Moses, they never listened to Moses anyway. They were always rebellious, just like their fathers. Timothy 3.13 says, For those who serve well as deacons get a good standing for themselves and also get confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 12.9, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. Ephesians 3, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of grace, God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. The apostles are given Stephen the gift of being able to perform miraculous signs for the purpose of confirming the words which he spoke. The apostles given this power by laying on of hands. The enemies of the assembly couldn't make a convincing argument against anything Stephen said, so they plotted to dishonest trap for him based on lies. All who were sitting in San Rita looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. The Old Testament tells the story of Moses' face glowing with radiance when he came down from, the, from Sinai or right to the or tabernacle after being in the presence of the angel who represented God. Men, when you teach in heaven, let there always be a glow in your face, a gleam in your eye, a grin in your lips. When you teach on hell, your normal face will do just fine, Charles Spurgeon said. Stephen had a perfect peace in his face and the charges brought against him. Ecclesiastes 8 says, Who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. It was full confidence Stephen faced his accusers. He knew he was facing death, but he faced them anyway. 
this phenomenon that angelic face of Stephen should have been assigned to these Jews that Stephen had a direct connection with God. I don't think it's too far-fetched to think that at that moment God's Spirit took over for Stephen and guided him through his defence and death. As he was dying, Stephen was given a vision of heaven and of Jesus there waiting for him. Not a bad way to die. Then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? This is the question brought to them fourth is seven. What are these things about what the high priest asked? These are things which have been said of Stephen by the false witnesses. Stephen will be charged with speaking against the holy place and against the law. In answer, Stephen here begins to retelling the history of Israel. Why is he retelling the history of Israel a defense of Christian teaching? Stephen sees that what is happening is really just one more link in the chain. He will not speak about the present until he has spoken about the past. This is really an Eastern speech, which we probably can't understand as clearly as the Jews themselves did. This is because we probably feel we do not feel our relationship with our nation's past quite so keenly as did the Jews. They love to listen to a recital of their nation's history, especially when spoken of a way in which God had been with his people. And in this case, for a time, they listened attentively and even with pleasure to what Stephen had to say. Before studying the psalm of Stephen in greater detail, it's best to step back and examine it as a whole and get the bigger picture. What the psalm is not, it's not a defence. It's given in context. We would have expected Stephen to give a defence for his faith. After all, he's on trial for his life. Instead, we see not a defence, but an indictment of the Jews themselves. It's not an evangelistic appeal. The content of Stephen's sermon is completely different from any other sermon given in the book of Acts. There's almost no mention of either Jesus or his resurrection, neither is there a call for repentance, but only a strong accusation of guilt. What a sermon is, this sermon is the longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts, twice as long as Peter's sermon and Peter Pentecost recorded. It is scriptural, it's basically a retelling of the entire story of the Old Testament. Much of it consists of direct quotations from the scriptures, his conclusion merely applying the message of those scriptures to his hearers. It has geographical orientation. Stephen focuses on the land, the temple, the law. The charge against him was that he spoke against this holy place. He speaks of the places where God dwelt with Israel, not in the temple. It begins with Mesopotamia, where he first called. He then takes him to Haran, to the Euphrates River. He then takes him to the Promised Land, and then to Egypt in the days of Joseph. He returns us to Shechem for Jacob's burial, and then back to Jerusalem, uh, Egypt. He retells how the Lord appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. He recaps the exodus from Egypt through the Red Sea. He tells of the forty years in the wilderness. He mentions the tabernacle and the temple. But it was a disclaimer that the Lord does not dwell in house made with hands. He has a rejection motive. God chooses to God chooses to use Joseph even though he had been rejected by his brothers. God chooses to use Moses even though he had been disowned by his fellow Israelites. <clears throat> God chooses his prophets, but they are persecuted and killed by the Israelites. God chose the righteous one, who was betrayed and murdered by the very Sanhedrin who now sits in judgment over Stephen. It is spirit-filled. Stephen was described in Acts chapter 6, 3 as a man full of the spirit and wisdom, and 5 as a man full of the faith and the Holy Spirit, and 8 as a full of grace and power, and at the time of his death he was said to be full of the Holy Spirit. Yet though this was a <coughs> spirit-filled sermon, no one came to Christ as a result of hearing it, Instead, it brought about Stephen's death. It is the same true today with the message of the gospel we preach. To some, it is a message of life. To others, it is a message of death. In spite of the theme of judgment evident in this sermon, it is not motivated by anger or resentment, but by love and grace. Verse 8 says, Stephen was full of grace. His last words will be a prayer of intercession on behalf of those who are putting him to death. If you're hanging in there so far, please feel free to come back uh, to continue this idea of the life and death of Stephen.